Okay, it's recording. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Welcome again to the Let's Talk Stem Cell event. My name is Kulpi Chima, and I'm one of the special events coordinator with Let's Talk Science. And for our next session, we'll be uh, going to conduct interviews with professionals working with stem cells. So we will be we will talk to them about their background, their research, and how they got to their current position. So first, we have Dr. Nika Shakiba. Dr. Shakiba is currently an assistant professor in the School of Biomedical Engineering at University of British Columbia. Her group applies systems and synthetic biology approaches to track the social lives of stem cells, uncovering why sometimes they don't get along and get into fights with one another. Dr. Shakiba did her PhD in Professor uh, Peter Zanstra's stem cell bioengineering lab at the University of Toronto, where she focused on understanding why some skin cells are better at reprogramming to a stem cell state. After her PhD, she did a postdoctoral fellowship at the Synthetic Biology Center in the Department of Bio Biological Engineering at, at MIT. Her work involved designing genetic controllers to guide uh, human skin cells as they reprogram to a stem cell state, um, thereby improving the efficiency of their conversion. Outside of research, she's very passionate about science outreach and communication and mentorship. Um, she's a co-founder of a very interesting initiative called Advice to a Scientist, which aims to bring knowledge, mentorship opportunities, and advice to anyone interested in uh, careers in STEM. Um, so I, I would really uh, recommend checking that uh, resource out because it's really fantastic. Um, she's also very active with the stem cell talk events and has helped expand the event to nine cities across Canada. She's always looking for more opportunities to share her passion for science and engineering with curious minds. Um, thank you so much again, Dr. Shakiba, for taking out the time to chat with us today. Um, so I will start this interview by asking you to tell us a little bit about more about your work in stem cell research. So we briefly touched upon it in the intro, but uh, it would be great to get it, uh, get a little bit more detail. Absolutely. And thanks for that great intro. You make me sound so fun. <laughs> um, it's my pleasure to be here virtually. Um, and I guess I could wrap up the story of what my lab is interested in uh, all around, like you said, the social lives of stem cells. And stem cells, like humans, don't always get along, yet they live in these multicellular societies where it's their job to coordinate and produce, you know, our tissues and organs maintain them as they grow and repair. And so these types of interactions between them are really interesting. And we're particularly interested in understanding why that goes wrong. And sometimes the stem cells that are in our developing embryos or in our bodies don't get along. They'll kind of look around to their neighbor and see, hey, you, you're not pulling your weight. I should get rid of you. And they'll get into these very physical battles and eat each other or you know, somehow kill each other off. Um, so we're really interested in understanding those very non-Canadian, not friendly neighborly interactions and seeing how we can use that to our advantage to make stem cell based therapies safer and more efficient, um, but also just to understand our biology, like how do our bodies work and how come cells um, work the way they work or, or don't get along or whatever the situation may be. So that's a kind of um, high level description of what my lab's interested in. Practically speaking, we're just a bunch of, you know, diverse people from diverse backgrounds. We're engineers. Some of us are chemical engineers. Some of us are, you know, electrical engineers. Others are biologists. So one of my students is an immunologist. And we're just all interested in answering these types of questions about stem cells together. So we do that in this, in this lab environment that involves programming to kind of simulate how a cell behaves with experiments where we actually put the cells together in addition, ask if they're gonna get along and if they're not, how are you killing each other? Um, so that's kind of a, a picture of what we do day to day. Sounds good. Um... So I, the next question I have is, uh, I mentioned in the intro about you doing a PhD and a postdoctoral fellowship. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about what these programs or degrees are? Um, what happens when you enroll in these programs? Um, I, I'm sure high, our audience would be really interested to know. Yeah, honestly, I didn't know too much about it either when I got into this academic pipeline, but I went along with it because it, it was just so much fun. But essentially what happens is after high school, 
Some people choose to go on to university and do an undergraduate degree. And that I think gives you a broad sort of base. You get good foundation in whatever area you've chosen. And for me, I chose engineering, specifically biomedical engineering. And I came out knowing a bit about, you know, the various areas of biomedical engineering, and I had some breadth to my expertise, but I didn't have very targeted expertise. I was really curious about stem cells in particular. And as an engineer, I really wanted to get in there and see if I could provide a perspective for how to control their behaviors, to make them do what we want them to do for cell therapy and regenerative medicine applications. Can we use engineering to understand them better? And so I decided to do a PhD. And what a PhD is, is essentially you become the scientist, quote unquote, even if you're an engineer, you can still be considered a scientist. And I think of myself as that. Um, and your job is to really work on the edges of science where there are no answers, right? So you formulate a scientific question that no one has an answer to, and your job is to figure out how to answer it. So it's like this discovery process that you don't have a roadmap for. I can't really go Google it. Um, so I did my PhD, my specific research question was, how does a skin cell turn into a stem cell? Because in 2006, there was this wild discovery that we could actually force these skin cells to forget that they're skin cells and revert back to a stem cell state. And they reacquire this ability, this potential to produce all the different cell types in the body. That's the magic of a pluripotent stem cell. So I wanted to understand how that happens and why some cells do it better than others and how cells may influence their neighbors as they're doing this. And one of the observations we had was not surprisingly after all the intro discussions we had that these cells don't always get along and they bully each other. And some cells are better able to reprogram, which means turn from that skin cell to a stem cell. And then they eliminate their neighbors that are, are not so good at it. So that's what fell out of um, my experiments. But essentially I worked to, um, to you know, figure out how best to answer this question. You have you know, support around you. So you have a supervisor. So Peter was my supervisor and he would meet with me on a weekly or bi-weekly basis. And we would go over my plans for experiments and what's going wrong, what's not working. Cause sometimes, you know, you do experiments and 90% of them don't work out the way you intended them to work. And so that's part of the fun, but the challenge also of doing a PhD. Mm -hmm. And then once you're done, for me, it took seven years. Once I was done, I had like, you know, contributed this little bit to the whole scientific world, right? I threw, you know, I threw out all my discoveries and you hope that that has an impact and, and the rest of the scientific community uses it. Sometimes it's not immediately used and it's like down the line that we realized, mm -hmm. oh wow, this like amazing discovery has changed the way we view things. Mm -hmm. um, so you're a little, you know, a contribution to that world of science. Um, and then you become an expert in that very, you know, small area. <laughs> you know, for me, it was reprogramming and stem cells. And then I decided I want to expand my, my technical know-how. I want to learn how to program cells genetically, engineer them in a more predictable, robust way. And that's what led me to synthetic biology, which is all about viewing a cell as like a little mini computer. And the DNA is like software code, right? And we could write to the DNA code that we want the cell to use. And that will tell the cell what to do, right? So presumably we can write a code that says, hey, hey cell, become green. And it'll read that code and become green. But we can also program much more sophisticated behaviors like, hey cell, detect a cancer cell around you and kill it. Those are the types of programs that people in synthetic biology are trying to program and you know, enable. And there are quite a few of those advances happening, which is really cool. So I kind of got sucked into that. It's also a very engineering way to think about a cell as this kind of mm -hmm. processor you can program. So yeah. I decided to do my postdoc in that. And a postdoc is just postdoctoral studies. So after you've got your doctoral degree or PhD, you just continue being this like, you know, scientist, this essentially just a human that's curious about the world around them. That's all it is, just fancy words mm -hmm. for that. Um, and I joined Ron Weiss and Domitilla Del Vecchio's labs in Boston. And I learned, I spent the first like year just learning from the people around me, like, how do you do this genetic engineering the way, you know, it's done in synthetic biology. And then I started applying it to this project, which was about reprogramming. So we wanted to use these improved, new and improved genetic controllers that could really guide these skin cells as they're being reverted back to a stem cell state more accurately, more efficiently, rather than just 
hoping for the best, which was a lot of what was happening in the field. Um, and, and yeah, that's what my whole postdoctoral experience was about. But the whole scientific journey is a bit of a pick your own adventure, right? Like find what the questions that make you excited, that make you curious, and then figure out how to answer them. And, and you know, work with the people around you to figure out how best to answer them. Okay. Yeah, that was, that was a great overview. Thank you so much. Um, I think my next question would be, um, so as your role as an assistant professor, um, what does your typical work day look like? And we would, I guess we can talk about pre-COVID as a work day yeah. <laughs> and has COVID changed your work day and how has it? So I just started my position as an assistant professor back in July. So I don't have oh. a pre-COVID reference. I started <laughs> mid-COVID, but um, yeah. of course it's basically part of the scientific pipeline, right? I did my mm -hmm. PhD, I did my postdoc, and then I started my own lab. That's what an assistant professor does. We basically mm -hmm. construct our own research lab. We get to decide the questions that we wanna lead. We get to pick the students that we're gonna work with, the other scientists that we're gonna work with to answer those questions. And then we're like a startup. I got to convince, you know, the federal and the provincial governments to give me money to answer those questions, right? I got to convince my fellow Canadians that these are worthwhile scientific questions to invest their money answering. And so that's a bit about like what my day to day now looks like. I write a lot of these grant proposals where I write down my, you know, ideas, my scientific ideas for how we can program stem cells and how we can make them get along or understand why they don't get along. Um, and then I hope for the best. I give it out to the, the funding agencies and, and, you know, my peers review and they decide I'm going to give you money or I'm not. And um, the day I that's part of the day to day. The other aspect of the day to day is I have graduate students. So these are now students that are doing their master's or PhDs with me, much like I did with Peter. I'm their supervisor and they're devising their projects, their questions that they're curious about. And of course, we have selected students that have mutual interest with mine. They're also interested in the social lives of stem cells. And we formulate their projects and I guide them. So in the beginning, a lot of it was I would be in the lab with them, show them how to do the daily you know, experiments that we would do with stem cells, with synthetic biology tools that we use. And now it's a little bit more virtual. They've become quite... Um, good at doing a lot of their experiments and they're, tra they're training each other, they're training new students that are coming in to work with us. So I've been spending a lot of time with my whiteboard, which you can't see, but it's here in the background. So I write my ideas on the whiteboard, I stare at the whiteboard a lot, I write things down. And then when I get bored of doing that, I go into the lab and I help my students <laughs> do like our experiments. So that's the day-to-day -day life of an assistant professor. We're basically just, we're paid to do science, right? And be scientists and to do things that hopefully will be impactful and beneficial for Canadians and the world. Um, the other part of my job uh, is teaching, right? So I have to teach courses at university. So I teach a synthetic biology course for graduate students. I co-teach a course all about what, it, what does it mean to be a graduate student? Like, how do I be a graduate student? How do I make a CV? How do I write a cover letter? All these practical skills of being a scientist. Mm -hmm. So that's the other part of my life. Yeah, that was a great answer. Yeah. And I like the analogy with the startup because it does. Yeah, you were working on your own and you're yeah, working with a team. So that was Oh, yeah. Great. We spent like a week just designing our logo. It was a great fun. <laughs> that was really fun. Yeah. yeah. Um, so my next question is about the skills that you are that you use at your job and you think are most important. So what are the most important skills that you that you need for this career? As with any area of science, critical thinking, right? To be able to look at what you're seeing, whatever type of science you're doing and ask why or how, right? And then to go further, like, okay, I have maybe some ideas of why or how this could be happening. How do I test it? Like, what do I need to do in the lab to make that happen? Or what kind of computer simulation or mathematical equation do I need to devise to explain whatever scientific phenomena I'm looking at? And then whatever data you end up collecting with your experiments or with your computer simulations, how do I interpret this? What is this telling me? What are the limitations of, of the experiments that I did that, you know, things that could be missing? Um, what kind of information am I missing? Like, what don't I know? And therefore, what other experts should I reach out to to help me understand and coordinate with them and collaborate with them and learn from them? So just that having that critical eye of, you know, always asking why and how and pushing the boundaries a little bit further 
And all of that, I think, is fundamentally rooted in the ability to connect to your motivations. Like, what is it that makes you excited as a human, as a scientist, about the world around you? And keep that going as your fuel, right? Like, never lose touch with that because it's easy to. So many of our experiments fail. Like, my, my student literally just messaged me and said, oh, man, I sorted my cells and they're all dead. Like, you know, that's hard. You spend hours doing an experiment and then it completely fails. But you got to pick yourself up and remind yourself why you're doing these experiments and keep going. Um, so I think that's a, a skill too. It takes practice to have that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, resi resiliency is such a such a big, yeah. Exactly. Like when we talk, I talk to like my cousins who are interested in e PhD and they think you have to be intelligent. I think you have to be intelligent and resilient to absolutely. do a PhD and um, yeah critical so that was yeah that was absolutely great. and to like always want to learn more like intelligence yeah. is great but it's it's more so about like wanting to learn and seeking mm -hmm. that information that's what makes you yeah. intelligent in my mind right mm -hmm. absolutely yeah um okay so the next question i have is about um how do you incorporate stem cells in your work and how have you seen them being used in medicine and research I mean, my work is all about stem cells. We're interested in understanding what they do. So we follow them around in a dish. We, we use live imaging, which is basically just like movies of stem cells. We'll like follow them crawling around. We'll follow them interacting with each other. Then we modify them. We'll genetically modify them or we'll modify the world that they live in, um, the nutrients around them, how far they are from one another. And then we ask what happened now? Are they getting along now? So, um, we're all like they are our muse. Stem cells are our muse, and we're interested in understanding their lives. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and in terms of like how people are using stem cells, there's so many things going on, right? Like my lab is very much at the point of discovery side of science, like just basic questions of how stem cells behave. Um, mm -hmm. But I think we're once we've found some interesting things about their interactions with one another, we want to use that, translate that knowledge to make some clinical impacts um, and hopefully impact the way stem cells are used to derive therapies. Because there's a whole booming biotechnology industry out there that is aiming to use stem cells to derive cells that can then be transplanted into a patient. And this could be used to maybe like your heart is damaged will develop heart in a dish, heart cells in a dish, inject them into a patient. Hopefully that helps them regenerate some of their lost heart tissue. Um, similarly for Parkinson's patients. Um, so there's all these kind of cell therapies going on and stem cells are a, the substrate for that because they're so potent. They can make all of these cell types on demand and they can grow and grow. So we can make millions and billions of them and then turn them into the cells that we want and then transplant them. That's like a relatively manufacturable process that you know bioengineers and scientists are working on, on perfecting. And so we wanna help that pipeline. Um, so that's a lot of what I see around me, these really cool biotech companies that are using stem cells. And there's others doing similar sort of basic science of stem cell okay. projects out there. Yeah, okay. Um, I guess my next question, you kind of touched upon it. Um, so we talked about your research with stem cells in, a, in an academic or university setting. So mm -hmm. what other settings can people work in with stem cells? Oh, yeah, so yeah. this whole biotech industry is, is a great one. I think it's it's going to boom. And this next generation is going to be the one, hopefully, that rides that wave and really makes it happen. Because similar to like Silicon Valley and the Google and the Facebook excitement, now there's a whole like biotech industry of cell therapy companies that are making these cells on demand for treating patients. And that requires people who are able to work with the stem cells, manipulate the stem cells to measure what they're doing, to make all of those processes safe and robust and reproducible. That's what you really need in a manufacturing pipeline. So there's that happening and it's happening all across Canada. So that's one of the sort of um, strategic areas of investment, I think that Canadian biotech people are really keeping their eyes on. So it's a good, good area to also keep your eyes on if you're thinking about a job in STEM. Absolutely. Um, and the next question, I think you also touched upon a little bit, but if, if we can get into more detail is what kind of tools, equipments and technology do you mostly use in your work with stem cells? 
a lot of microscopy, like I said, because the cells are tiny. I wish we could see them. We can't, we got to use microscopes. So a lot of that. Um, we also do a lot of DNA based work, right? So like I said, we write programs, the DNA of the cells, we upload it into them. And then sometimes we want to read the DNA too. <laughs> so we use sequencing technologies um, that, you know, we can extract the DNA of the cell, read it and see what it's been doing, what it's been up to. Um, so that's another one of our core technologies. We love flow cytometry. If you've ever had a blood test done, some of the more advanced blood tests involve flow cytometry, where literally you take the sample of cells and you flow them in a single cell line and they pass by a series of these lasers. And it basically just lets you see what that cell is expressing, what kind of proteins it's got, what kind of cell is it? It'll tell you the size of the cell. And you end up seeing all this information about each individual cell that passes through the flow cytometer. So that's our bread and butter. We use that a lot mm -hmm. in my lab. Um, other than that, we do simulations. We, we like to not just watch what the cells do, but then we like to go to the computer and kind of simulate it. Hey, can, can I try to predict what you're gonna do? <laughs> so we have a lot of um, Python scripts that we're developing. We're learning together, actually, my lab and I, we're learning Python. I'm not a Python programmer. I did all my learning in MATLAB. So I've ventured into the world of Python and there's tons of online resources to do that for anyone who's interested in coding. Um, so. We're, we're developing Python codes to simulate stem cells. So many different tools to use in this world. <laughs> yeah, yeah, very cool. Yeah, um, I've been also learning Python on my own. So oh. it's, it's a hard language for sure. <laughs> it is, but so useful. You can use it for everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That would be, I think, one of the suggestions. Like, I, I wished I had learned coding. So yeah, if yes. students are hearing, yeah. That's a, that's yes. a really good skill. <laughs> it has such utility in areas you would never know. Yeah. Like, who would have thought a stem cell researcher would use Python? Trust me, it'll help you in, in everything, data analysis yeah. and simulations yeah. and everything. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I guess the next question is something I'm always curious about um, different careers is what are some things that you enjoy the most about your job and what do you find challenging about your job? I guess what I like the most and what I find challenging go hand in hand, but I kind of like that I can direct my scientific questions like I'm not answering to someone that says like let's go study this specific cell and why it's killing that other cell. No, I can decide the question that I want to answer myself and that's the power of doing science it's like leading you know following your own discovery and leading the way and working with others who have similar curiosities. Um, that can also be, uh, it's a blessing, but it can also be a challenge because you can get distracted. So we have so many questions. We have just like a notebook where we're writing all of these questions and ideas that we're coming up with and collaborations like, oh, I saw that talk by this other scientist who's using this cool technology. I want to use that technology to answer our questions. Then you can really explode the number of projects you want to do. And so it, it's challenging to kind of keep it a straight kind of vision of like, we're going to do this first, then this, let's not get distracted. Um, so that's one of the things I love and also find really <laughs> challenging of my day to day. Um, I also really love working with other, especially younger scientists, because they have fresh ideas, right? Like my, my students inspire me. I kind of give them the space to come up with what they find exciting and I, I follow them sometimes, right? I'm not always the one doing the talking though, as you can see, I ramble. Um, <laughs> so they do a lot of the question making and you know experiment proposing and I love that. That's a great opportunity to learn from others. So yeah. Yeah, Absolutely. yeah I love that, yeah. Um, I guess the next question we also again touched a little bit, but where do you see the future of stem cell research going? Yeah, I see it getting to a place where we really can change the way medicine works. Regenerative medicine is such a promising area, right? We can't regenerate our limbs. We can't regenerate tissues on a large scale. But here is this field where we can harness the power of a stem cell to do that. Granted, we're not there yet. There aren't cell therapies for everything. And that's a whole other area of like stem cell tourism where, you know, unapproved clinics will say, hey, yeah, we'll treat every ailing disease we have. you have. Come over here, we'll inject you with stem cells. There's definitely that hype out there and people are excited to see stem cells do it. 
it's not quite there. However, there are some therapies that are now in clinical trials and bone marrow transplants, for example, have been around for a while. And those are used to treat a lot of like blood-based diseases and that uses blood stem cells. That's what's, that's the magic sauce in bone marrow mm -hmm. transplants. So I think that's just like opening the floodgates of the possibilities of what we can do with stem cells. And now that it's intersecting with fields like synthetic biology, systems biology, we're being able to predict and engineer the stem cells to behave exactly how we want them to behave. And so when we put them in a patient's body, we'll have a much more control and understanding of what's gonna happen. And I think that's kind of where the future of that regenerative medicine world is gonna go. It's gonna be these very programmable cells that we can upload functions into like apps on a phone. They'll have the ability to roam you know, our bodies and do you know, the apps, the functions that we wanted, like find a cancer cell, kill it, you know, whatever the function may be. So I, that's the future I envision. How many years away it is, I don't know, it's kind of hard to say, but I think we're gonna get there. Um, there's already really cool clinical trials happening with stem cells, so I'm hopeful. <laughs> yeah, very interesting. Um, so we're kind of nearing towards the end. So I have like two more questions. So yeah. the first one would be, is there anything else you would like to share about your job or career path as a researcher that we did, didn't discuss already? Um, yeah. I would just say it's such a pick your own adventure. Like every yeah. day is so different for me. And I really, I kind of love that, right? I get <laughs> bored really easily. So especially like this TikTok era, you're always like hyper stimulated by all these mm -hmm. things around you. I get bored. And so I like the ability to be able to, you know, hop between the types of questions that I'm asking, work with different people, collaborate on different projects, learn from people. Right? That's the bottom line, what a scientist is doing. We're constantly learning and asking questions and trying to answer them. So I just, I hope people can, can see that potential in a career in science, whatever type of career it is, that critical thinking and the problem solving, it makes your day different every day. And that can be really fun. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess the last question I have is, what advice do you have for high school students who are thinking about what to do next and um, interested in, in a job um, or a career as a researcher? What, what, do, what can they do right now? I would say ask questions, do exactly <laughs> what it is you're trying to do, right? Like long-term as a scientist, talk to the people that you see, like, you know, you've Googled someone, they seem cool, reach out to them. There's this sort of culture in science that we give advice willingly to each other because we received advice and that's how we were raised as scientists. That's what the whole advice to a scientist initiative is about, by the way, just like harnessing the willingness of scientists to share ideas and advice with one another. And so don't be afraid to reach out to people. You'll be surprised um, at how willing they would be to answer your questions. And if not, sometimes like what, what did you lose, right? Maybe they don't answer to you. Oh, well right mm -hmm. um, or maybe they don't have the time or the expertise and they pass you on to someone one of their colleagues or someone they know um, and those types of connections you build with people like we're humans at the end of the day those connections are what's really going to pave the way for you you might end up finding a mentor or a teacher or someone who will really change your direction and that happens so often right um, so you got to harness it make those opportunities happen that will kind of inspire you and and lead the way for your future. You kind of never know what will happen. I certainly didn't know I was going to end up in stem cells when I started engineering, but I kind of just went with what was curious, uh, what I found my curiosity in and mentors around me that enabled it like Peter. Um, so find your mentors that will empower you. And the way to do that is to ask, meet them, tweet at them, whatever it is. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, that was, a, that was a great advice. Again, um, asking question is such a such a huge, I think Absolutely. we're always afraid that we might ask stupid questions, but they there are no stupid questions. There are no, like what's the worst thing that'll happen, right? Yeah. Who cares? Just yeah. ask your questions, yeah. ask what you do. Like what you're yeah. that type of scientist. What does that mean? Tell me mm -hmm. more about it. Why did mm -hmm. that do? <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. This was, yeah, this was also great. Um, again, thank you so much for sharing, your, uh, for answering our questions and sharing your experiences and, and expertise. And um, this was really informative. Yeah. And I'm sure students will find your journey very inspiring. So thanks again. Oh, well, thank you. And thanks so much for having me. This was fun.
even though yeah. virtual we're used to it i guess virtual, at this point, yeah. <laughs> pre-recorded but again um, feel free <laughs> we will put in the resources so again advice to a scientist is another really great resource they have you can have like avatars of uh, starting from high school student all the way as a pi so you can um, go through the um, that resource so we will put that as a link in the awesome. uh, resources so and it's yeah, very much I'll... in development so anyone who has feedback or thoughts Please yeah. do send it our way. <laughs> okay, that's great. Well, thanks again. And um, thanks everyone. And we'll see you in the next session. Bye. Bye. Okay.